Uh, let me say a few words. I'm, I'm Wen Yip. I'm a substitution for Professor Yin Zhen Pan, who, who is the, actually the organizer of this um, online seminars, um, uh, which is for the Delta uh, Young Astronomer Award this, And Professor Kevin Han got the awards, uh, I think several years ago, was it? Uh, uh, the, but you can see him, you know, he's a real young. So you can imagine when, how young he was when he got the award. I'm not that now young. he's uh, he's a major professor, <laughs> a huge professor now in Munich. In Munich. He's moving to he's now still in 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 West Bern, being a director of the Center for Habita Habitability or something right, also planet. Yeah, but he's uh, moving to to Munich uh, and building up a group. Uh, I think it would be very promising, very interesting uh, place to be in Munich besides the Oktoberfest and from now on. The, uh, so with uh, uh, Kevin Han, he, 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 he did his graduate, undergraduate in National Singapore University. And afterward, he went to Colorado to get his PhD. And uh, he spent only four years in his uh, PhD study. Yes. Uh, uh, so now he's, he's uh, I would say, I guess he's uh, 40 years old or 39 years old, if not younger. Um, the, oh, okay. okay. Uh, and the... And he's a specialist on, on exoplanets um, and on also on planetary atmosphere, which are really something very really complicated thing I could never understand. So I'm very happy to hear him to give this talk. And the title is uh, planetary, uh, Exoplanetary Atmosphere, Albedo and Phase Curves. And as we, some of us who have been working on small bodies like asteroids, we know how important those uh, phase curves are, you know, in telling the, the physical characteristic uh, of, 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 of planetary objects from afar. That you cannot resolve them, and then the Professor Kevin Hain, he has a genius idea and method to derive the physical properties. And you wrote a book, right, or uh, 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 one or two books? I, I have a tw twenty seventeen textbook that, um, when I look back, I wish I could have done better. So I will write the second edition soon. Okay, okay. But that one, the, the new book got the prize from uh, from the AAS Astronomical Astronomical Society, right? Um, in 2018, yes. Yeah, right. So, so it's a huge achievement for a young person. And of course, besides that, he has this our Delta Young Young Astronomer Award. And I believe that I believe that I'm sure that I will bet on it. He will get more awards in future. Let's let's wait and see. Okay, Kelvin, it's all yours now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wing, for your very kind introduction um, and for saying such nice things. I have very fond memories of the trip to Taiwan, and I really hope to uh, come back. Actually, before I start, I would. I have actually one request. It would be really nice if those of you who are comfortable can just turn on your camera <laughs> because otherwise I'm not, I'm not just speaking to a, to a blank uh, screen. It would be nice to see some faces if you don't mind. Um, um, then um, the, the second thing I wanna say is that I, I set aside a um, um, couple of hours on my schedule so I can go a bit slower. I, you can ask questions whenever you like. And after the talk, if you would like, you can, stick around and we can have a discussion. The discussion can be about the talk or it can be about career or whatever you want. So, so we can have a, about two hours together if you can spare the time. So um, I would like to now um, show you this. So, so again, thank you for having me. I, as I said, I, I have very fond memories of Taiwan and I would really like to go back sometime in the future when, especially when you gather all of the the Delta awardees. Um, so when I, I was asked to give this talk, I had I had two choices. First, first you can hear me, right? Everyone can hear me. So so I had I had two choices. I could either give you like a review talk where I would show you all of the things that my group is doing, uh, which I can do at some point, or I could just focus on one very specific. Uh, result that we got recently. And this is the choice I made. And also because I'm very excited by this result. This result is described in two papers, uh, both of which I, I was lead author on this year. So the result is very new. So the first result was published in Nature Astronomy in uh, at the end of August. So it's very new. And then the second result was published a few months earlier in FJ Letters. And there are really only three collaborators on this. One is um, Brad Morris is an observer in my group. Daniel Kitzman is a senior uh, researcher and a theorist in my group. 
And Li Ming Li is a professor in Houston whom I have never met in my life. I just emailed him and I asked him for Cassini data. I don't even know how he looks like. And he was very responsive over email and he gave me lots of data. So we wrote a paper together without actually ever speaking to each other. Um, so this is the, the result um, um, published on 30th of August. Uh, the, the title is uh, Closed Form Up and Issue Solutions of Geometric Albedos and Reflected Light Phase Curves. So by the end of this talk, I, I really hope that um, you, uh, you can understand what closed form, what up and issue, what geometric albedos, and what phase curves actually mean. That's the, that's the point of the talk. And, and I'm very proud of this result. I consider this the, the most important result of my career so far, because this is the approximate, and you will, again, get a chance to understand what approximate means. But it's the very general solution to a mathematical problem in classical astronomy uh, first posed by the Princeton astronomer Henry Norris Russell in, in 1916. So if you're convinced of this statement, then this is the approximate but general solution to a problem that's 105 years old. So um, before I launch into a description of this paper, I just wanted to give you some background as to how I, I came to this result. So exoplanets are planets orbiting other stars beyond the solar system. You, you, you already know this. Uh, exoplanet detection is now routine. It's very common. It's so routine that the field is firmly established and two Nobel Prizes were given out uh, two years ago. The, the next frontier, which everyone wants to do, is the detailed characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. And the reason why you care about exoplanet atmospheres is because um, unlike for the solar system where you can send machines and probes, uh, these exoplanets are really, really far away. So there's no chance of you reaching them. And therefore everything needs to be done um, uh, using remote sensing but a, a very challenging form of remote sensing. So beyond measuring mass and radius, uh, the, the, only thing you, the only other thing you can do that just goes beyond mass, radius, and density is to measure the, the spectra of these atmospheres and then try to say something about the atmospheric chemistry of these exoplanets. And atmospheric chemistry can be used in two ways as a tool. It can be used to tell you something about the formation history of the exoplanet, or it can be used to tell you something about the, the, the so-called habitability conditions of the exoplanets. And in the distant future, if we search for so-called biosignatures, it will probably also come through the atmosphere. So this is the, the broad brush um, um, sense of where everyone is trying to go in the field. But then there are two main um, obstacles, uh, at least from a theoretician's point of view, when you try to interpret these spectra. One is something uh, called parameter degeneracies, meaning that um, if you have a model describing the spectrum, then many different combinations of the parameter values will give you the same spectrum, right? So, so meaning that instead of a single answer for your parameter value, like the abundance of water or the abundance of methane, you get uh, probability distributions of abundance of water and abundance of other molecules that are correlated with each other. And so, uh, any approach that uh, interprets these spectra robustly has to take this into account. The second obstacle is, of course, always that we, we never completely understand the physics or chemistry. This is always true. Otherwise, we, we don't have a job. And the two um, parameter degeneracies and incomplete understanding of physics and chemistry are, are related in many ways. And, and one of the big problems that affects both parameter degeneracies and incomplete understanding of physics is actually the problem of clouds and hazes and aerosols. This is, a, this is a very hard problem that permeates many branches of physics. So I, I show five branches here. And, and uh, broadly speaking, it can be summarized as uh, our inability to understand how macroscopic uh, structures form or behave because of our inability to either form, either, uh, form or describe uh, the physics of microscopic particles. So for example, in climate science on Earth, one of the biggest obstacles to predicting uh, uh, climate change and global warming is actually how the formation of uh, water, water clouds. And, and, where you and where you form the clouds, whether it's close to the Earth or away from the Earth, um, the height of the cloud will determine whether the cloud has a net cooling or net warming effect. And since the, the cooling and the warming are, are large numbers and you want to know the difference between these two large, large numbers, 
And the difference between these two large numbers depends on your ability to, to understand the microphysics of these clouds. This, this becomes a very hard problem. Uh, the other area where uh, clouds and hazes become very important are in the solar system. Um, this comes up in many solar system bodies. One example is early Mars. So um, if you look at the geology of Mars, this suggests that early Mars probably had some kind of surface water, whether it's persistent or intermittent is being debated. Uh, but, but the atmospheric scientists uh, struggle to find a model that produces water on early Mars. And part of the puzzle is because um, CO2 ice clouds seem to be part of the story and it's difficult to form them from first principles. Planet formation is a field that again for decades um, relies on our ability to understand how big structures, planets, form from smaller structures like embryos and pebbles and so on. And again, this is one of the areas where the microscopic affects the macroscopic. Same with, same with brown dwarfs. In brown dwarfs, there's a, an unsolved mystery called the LT transition, how do cloudy L dwarfs evolve to become cloud-free T dwarfs? Again, hinges on your ability to understand clouds and hazes and aerosols. So not surprisingly, when you get to exoplanet atmospheres, which, which is a very young field compared to these other few, we have exactly the same problem, right? So we would like to look at exoplanet atmospheres and we would like to extract, we would like to make statements like this atmosphere has this much water and this molecule and but it doesn't have that molecule. Unfortunately, these statements are degenerate with how you model the clouds and hazes in these atmospheres. So overall, this is a hard problem. So today I'm not gonna pretend that I can give you the answer to this problem, I, I, I cannot. But the papers I just mentioned to you, I think are a new tool, a new way to extract information from data so that you can then advance your understanding of clouds and hazes in different objects. So you should think of it as a mathematical solution that then gives you a new tool for data analysis. And this is what I will try to uh, describe to you in the next 45 minutes or so. So these are the two papers uh, again. So we, the two papers collect, collectively demonstrate that the fundamental properties of cloud hazes and aerosols at least average over the entire planet may be retrieved from precise photometry alone. If you're if you a planetary scientist, this is maybe not a surprising statement. If you're exoplanet scientist, this is a radical statement because in the literature now, everyone thinks that the way you do this is from spectroscopy, not from photometry. So I will show you two case studies. One is the um, using these solutions on the exoplanet uh, Kepler-7b. This is a hot Jupiter using Kepler data. Then I will show you how these solutions are used to analyze Cassini data of Jupiter. I've already told you about how these are uh, up initial solutions. Uh, this is the first time since um, Lambert in the 18th century and Hepke in 81 that these closed form solutions have been found. These up initial solutions mean that they are from first principles. They have no, at least given the assumptions we have made, they have no tuning parameters, which implies that they can be used to extract um, fundamental parameters from data. At least that's what we hope. And that's what I hope to demonstrate to you. So I would like to, the, uh, the talk has three parts. So first I walk you through the, the, the history of the field um, and some jargon. Then I will walk you through the theory. And then the last part, I will show you the, the, the implications for data analysis. So in order to do this work, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I had to read uh, literature that stretched back almost uh, more than a hundred years. So the oldest paper that I, I read on this was this, paper in 1861 by George Bourne. I, I think he was the director of Harvard Observatory at that time. And this paper uh, said many interesting things. One of the claims it made was that the albedo of Jupiter is about 96.7%. Um, first, it was not clear what albedo uh, George Bourne was referring to. In, in the modern jargon, there are at least five different types of albedos, as I will show you. And we now know that the so-called Bourne albedo of Jupiter is around 50%. We know this from um, from uh, Cassini data. Nevertheless, I think this is the paper that indirectly led to the coining of the term Born albedo, which is the amount of light reflected by a planet or a moon over all viewing angles and all, um, all wavelengths. Then there's this paper by uh, Henry Norris, Norris uh, Hen sorry, Henry Norris Russell in 1916 uh, from, from Princeton. And uh, this is a very interesting and influential paper. It, it 
it first laid down the, the, the mathematics in, in a proper way for these phase curves and albedos. It also showed that you could, um, you could both measure and calculate a quantity called the phase integral, which I will define to you several slides down. It doesn't matter what it is now. This is a, a, a some number and, and uh, given assumptions of classic reflection laws, you can calculate what this number is. So for example, and I will show you two of these reflection laws. So for example, the famous uh, re reflection law of Lambert, which I will describe shortly, gives you a phase integral of 1.5 and that of Seeliger gives you a phase integral of 1.64. But then you notice that these don't seem to match the real objects very well, right? The, the phase integrals of Venus, Moon and the Mercury look nothing like what these cut simple calculations are implying. The other paper that is really, or at least body of work that's really important to, to mention is the, is the work of the, the lunar scientist, uh, Bruce Hepke, who's, who's still alive. I think he's right now at Pittsburgh. He used to be at Cornell. I'm, I'm sure you know him. <laughs> and um, he, he has written a very influential body of work, which I will describe to you in a couple of slides uh, later in the talk. And he has, I think, dedicated part of his career or most of his career to studying the, the shape of the face curves of the moon and other rocky objects. And, and, and it's not hard to visualize this, right? So as, as you see the moon go around in its orbit and you see different uh, phases of the moon, then the, the, light of this, uh, the light from the moon will go up and down. It will be modulated by seeing different phases of the moon. And this is why it's called a phase curve. And as far as I understand, um, in his honor, the parameters that describe the function that describe the shape of these phase curves are often called Hepke parameters. So these are three influential uh, papers or bodies of work that I read. So now I promise you, I'll describe to you what a Lambertian sphere is. So this is uh, attributed to uh, Johann Heinrich Lambert in the 18th century. He's a Swiss um, physicist and mathematician and astronomer, I think, from Basel, not far from here, an hour away from where I am. And he uh, basically described an uh, uh, idealized object that doesn't exist in nature <laughs> called the Lambertian sphere, which has equal brightness in all directions, regardless of viewing angle. I mean, it doesn't take imagination to, to imagine that this, is pro this probably doesn't describe real objects. But it's, it's very easy to write down, right? So, so you can write down, given the intensity of the star, I, I star, uh, impinging on a surface at some angle theta star, uh, you have uh, outgoing intensity I zero, and they are simply related by the cosine of the angle. This is Lambert's cosine law. Very easy to write and you use it to derive all kinds of different things. But how well does Lambert's law actually work? And actually if you go to the solar system, it, it doesn't work at all. So for example, in the top left, you see this other this is the, the face, different reflected light face curves, reflected light from the sun of different objects. So Jupiter, the moons, Callisto, and Enceladus. And this is a Lambertian sphere in black. And you can see this is the Lambertian sphere. And the real objects don't look like Lambertian spheres. <laughs> and in fact, real objects have this cuspy profile, which the moon also has. Uh, this is an effect called the, the opposition search. We can talk about this during the Q&A if you like. And if you go to Cassini data of Jupiter, again, you, you see this cuspy profile that requires a, a polynomial to fit. And, and this is the paper uh, by Lee et al. in 2018. This is the paper that led me to Li Ming Li, who, whom I emailed and provided me with these, these, these data. Uh, there's also Cassini data of Saturn's rings. And you again, your eyes see this uh, cuspy profile that are not consistent with Lambertian spheres. So Lambert a Lambertian sphere is a very nice mathematical construction, but it doesn't seem to describe real data very well. So we need to do better. So now um, I would like to introduce you to some of the jargon. So what are albedos and phase curves, right? So, so, so this is the visual, right? This is zero phase angle means uh, superior conjunction, right? You see the whole phase if you're not hidden by the star. And this is inferior conjunction, right? And, and these are, and the phase angle is given by alpha. Um, as this object goes around in this orbit, you will see the flux go up and down. This is called a phase curve. 
And there are actually many different definitions of the albedo. And because the literature is so old, I was very respectful of the definitions and I didn't try to invent any new words. So I will show you all of these definitions that come from the historical literature. So the geometric albedo is the amount of reflected light at, at zero phase angle, right? So in this picture, as superior conjunction, so at only one position. The spherical albedo is the albedo uh, considered over all angles. So if you essentially average over all angles, roughly, you, you will get the spherical albedo. It's more an integral. The, uh, the Born albedo, and, and it's important to mention that the geometric and the spherical albedos are always defined at a single wavelength in theory. In, in practice, they are usually measured over a band pass, like a Voyager band pass or the Kepler band pass. The, the Born albedo is the spherical albedo measured over all wavelengths. Um, another way of saying this so that it's less abstract is that the geometric albedo and the spherical albedos are, are in, reflect the intrinsic scattering property of the surface of the atmosphere. So they depend on the properties of the surface itself, of the scattering surface. The Born albedo depends on both the intrinsic properties of the surface and the star. So for example, if I took a, a moon or planet with some spherical albedo and I put it around the sun, it will give me some Born albedo. If I remove it and I put it around a different star, I will get a different Born albedo, even though the geometric albedo or the spherical albedo is the same. The, the phase integral is the ratio of spherical to geometric albedo. So this is the, the one that we talked about. This is 1.5 if it's isotropic. And the single scattering albedo, which is a very good name, is the amount, is the fraction of light scattered in a single event. This is a fundamental quantity because omega is the scattering cross-section divided by the scattering plus absorptions cross-section. So it's the ratio of cross-sections, which, which are fundamental quantities. So all of the physics can be summarized as how do I relate the, the single scattering albedo, the amount of light scattered in one event, to these more um, macroscopic quantities where the light is scattered over the entire object uh, subjected to different geometries. So that's the mathematical problem. And now if I go back to this uh, cartoon, then um, if you're an exoplanet, uh, it can be demonstrated that if when the planet goes behind the star, the so-called secondary eclipse, and you can measure how much the light dips, which is the secondary eclipse depth D, then there's a direct relationship between the secondary eclipse depth and the geometric albedo. If you know the radius of the planet and you know the distance between the planet and the star. So if you are confident that you're measuring 100% reflected light from the star, if you use a telescope and you measure the secondary eclipse depth and you know these quantities, you get directly the geometric albedo. More generally, you can also reflect, you can measure the reflected light phase curve. So this would be the same as this, but now you have a dimensionless function that describes how the light goes up and down in the orbit. This describes essentially the shape of the phase curve. This is called the integral phase function. And if you can find, if you can find mathematical solutions for the geometric albedo and the integral phase function um, from first principles by solving the radiative transfer equation, then you're done. You have solved the entire problem. And this is what we are after. So it's not a difficult problem to state and um, but in the past, this has never been done in a general sense for every reflection law. So now I would like to show you some data um, to give you a sense that this is an old field. Um, so this is a paper from 91. This is Voyager data. And you can see that, you see, um, this, this paper and, and many others have measured things like geometric albedo, phase integral, born albedo for Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, right? So these are reported. Uh, as far back as 30 years ago. Uh, in this paper, the Born albedo of Jupiter is roughly 34%, um, but this has been revised by the, the more recent paper of Lee et al. in 2018, here it is. So Lee et al. Um, substantially revised the Born albedo of Jupiter. If you wanna know the reasons, you should read this paper. Um, and now it's closer to 50%. But the point of showing you this is that to show you the exquisite Cassini data, right? I told you that the geometric albedo is a function of wavelength. So you can see that it really depends on wavelength, right? And, and the spherical albedo also depends on wavelength. And therefore the, the phase integral also depends on wavelength. 
and encoded in all of this, these uh, functions is something about the, the nature of the, 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 the scatterers, the aerosols that scatter light of Jupiter's atmosphere. And this is the last part of the talk. I will tell you what the properties of these scatterers are just from analyzing the Cassini phase curves. Uh, finally, last slide on the, on the data. Um, we also have albedos of exoplanets. They are not as detailed as from like the Jupiter data, but you can at least measure secondary eclipse depths and you can measure, and you can therefore infer geometric albedos. So this is a paper from long ago I did with a colleague. And so we use Kepler data of a collection of hot Jupiters and we measured these um, um, secondary eclipses. We then converted them to geometric albedos, but this is not good enough because some of these objects are so hot that um, you're not measuring just reflected light. You're measuring also a little bit of thermal emission. It's contaminated by thermal emission. And if you don't have extra data, you cannot tell what the true albedo is. So we made some estimates. So in some cases, you can see that if you correct for the thermal emission, it's still within the observational error bars. So you know that this is more, most likely a, a real geometric albedo or reflected light. But in other cases, what you see like in this case of this very hot Jupiter, the, the measured secondary eclipse depth doesn't correspond to the, the real albedo. And we don't know what the real albedo is because we don't have, we do not know what the real um, thermal distribution is, right? But this can be done in some way. So this is a more modern paper, eight years later using um, data from TESS. Um, I was also involved on, in this paper as, a, as the fourth author. I was doing the interpretation for them. And, and you see this, um, you see that geometric albedos of hot Jupiters are roughly 10%. You can see some outliers here, but we have now reason to believe that these outliers are not really outliers. So on average, hot Jupiters are dark. They have geometric albedos of roughly 10%. And this is consistent with our knowledge of the physics of these objects. So there was a paper in 2000 by Sudaski that, that, that suggested that hot Jupiters, actually that predicted that hot Jupiters are, will, will be dark because um, they are so hot that, the, that sodium exists in its gaseous form. And, and hot sodium uh, has a very strong absorption cross-section and it absorbs in the visible range of wavelengths, exactly where these telescopes are measuring. So because of the strong sodium and potassium absorptions, we expect hot Jupiters to have geometric albedos of roughly 10%. So for once, the physics actually works. Um, and to date, we have found no strong trends with exoplanets or stellar properties. So, so this, is, um, this is the end of the first part. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions if you have them, any now. I cannot see the chat, so I, you would have to speak up. Or... I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll keep going, okay? Right, Pierce, go ahead. So, so I would like to um, give you some sense of the historical background as well. And, and the best way to tell this story is to show you the, 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 the people whose papers or books I, I, I had to read to understand this problem. So I already mentioned um, uh, Lambert in the 18th century and his Lambertian sphere model. Um, the other person who was very influential in, in my thinking about this was uh, Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar is a Nobel laureate, as you know, an Indian American uh, physicist. And Chandrasekhar did many wonderful things in his career. But one of his contributions to radiative transfer is that he found an exact solution for isotropic scattering in the semi-infinite atmosphere. I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a moment. There's also a very nice 1975 textbook by Viktor Sobolev, whom I can only describe as a, as a Russian master of radiative transfer. It's a really nice textbook, at least the English translation of it. Then there's a very influential paper in 81 by Hepke which provided a key solution to Chandrasekhar's solution. Key approximation, sorry, to Chandrasekhar's solution. So I'm gonna show you one slide on each of these, um, from each, on each, each of these people, just to give you a sense of my thinking. So as I mentioned to you, Chandrasekhar was um, very influential in all fields. He wrote this textbook in the 1960s, in 1960. And he found a solution for a semi-infinite atmosphere. So a semi-infinite atmosphere is not something that is finite in, in space. It's finite in optical depth, which means that it gets very, very opaque eventually. 
And this solution has, is expressed uh, in terms of what are nowadays known as the Chandrasekhar H functions, right? So this is a function that is a mathematician's dream, but uh, I think it's an astronomer's nightmare because you can see that the H function, which depends on the cosine of theta, requires you to evaluate an integral that depends on the H function itself. <laughs> So this is, this is really a nightmare if you want to fit data because you, you need an iterative solution. And there exists a literature, a small literature, just on Chandrasekhar H functions alone. So very elegant, but difficult to use. Hepke in 81 uh, discovered that you could write this implicit solution in an approximate explicit form. So instead of doing this, writing this, elegant solution where you had to evaluate the integral, you could write it as a solution, as a closed form formula. And mu is the cosine of, of, of the angle and gamma is square root of one minus omega where omega is the single scattering albedo, if you remember. And in that paper, there's a figure that, where Hapke shows that uh, the approximation is actually quite good. It's on the order of a percent, right? So, so, in, so Hapke did many things in this paper but one of the useful things he did, very useful things, is that he showed that you could, you could write down an explicit form for Chandrasekhar's H function, which I use in my own derivation. So when I started thinking about the problem, I, I thought, um, let's, let's work on the simplest thing first. Can I solve for single scattering in a semi-infinite atmosphere? So forget multiple scattering. Let's just think about single scattering, right? So like bounces off the surface once, can you actually solve for that? So I, I, I stared at this problem for must be a week. And every time I tried to write something down, um, I kept getting the boundary conditions wrong. <laughs> and when I tried to write something down, um, I always ended up with this very awkward combinations of, of, of mu's of the, the cosines of the angles, right? So this is the cosine of the, the incident angle and this is the cosine of the outgoing angle. So it always came up in this annoying conversation, combination that you see on my cursor. I say annoying because this combination made it very difficult to integrate on paper later to get other things I wanted. So I, I thought I must have done something wrong. <laughs> so I stared at this for very long and I wasn't sure if I was right. Then finally I realized that actually that this solution is actually very, very old. This solution goes back to uh, 1888. <laughs> in fact, it goes back to a uh, paper that's not even a paper. This, this, is, uh, this is the minutes of a meeting of the Scientific Academy of Bavaria in Southern Germany. It's all in German. And this is uh, on the photometry of reflective substances. And in this paper, uh, Hugo Seliger, who actually in some sense is my, is my academic ancestor because he was the director of Munich Observatory. He wrote down this, I, I couldn't really read the German. I didn't really try very hard but he wrote down a solution that you see, you can see the awkward combinations of cosines I told you about, right? In the previous slide, this awkward combination. So not surprising. And then there was another paper by his colleague Lomo. So it's not surprising that this eventually became known as the lomo uh reflection law. So when I saw this, I, I was finally convinced that I got the boundary conditions correct. So, so this was a very important paper for me. So if I put together all of these contributions, this is the mathematical DNA of the solution, right? So the, the outgoing intensity that includes both single and multiple scattering has a part that looks like the lomo seliger reflection law. It has a, yes, a so-called scattering phase function that describes single scattering. So the mathematical relationship between the ray going in and the ray going out and their angles. It has a part from Chandrasekhar that describes uh, isotropic multiple scattering which Hepke then simplified into an explicit form. So all of this came from different authors, Lomo, Siliga, Chandrasekhar, and Hepke. So, so why is this important? Because now that I have the explicit solution for the outgoing intensity, which is not new, the, uh, then I can use this to derive the, the other quantities that we are interested in, which, which I will show you. So now I want to tell you where um, Victor Sobolev came into the story. So he had this textbook and inside the textbook was a diagram that looked a lot like this. My diagram is a bit more, has more information than his diagram, but it, it looks very much like this diagram, right? 
And one of the things he made me realize is that there are actually there are at least six angles in the problem. There are really seven angles. And three, and any three of these angles can form one coordinate system. And, and Sobolev uh, in his book described two coordinate systems, right? So there's a, he didn't really call it by these names, but I call it by these names so I can understand it better. So there's a coordinate system that is from the observer's perspective, if you're sitting on Earth. So if you're sitting on Earth, there are three angles. One is the observer longitude in blue. One is the observer la latitude, which is in pink. And one is the orbital phase angle in red. So these three angles will make up one coordinate system, which I call the observer's coordinate system. If you are sitting on the planet, so if you are a, an element on the planet, there are three different angles. There's the observer's longitude in brown, in phi. There's the observer's latitude in this different color of pink. And then there's the zenith angle with respect to the star, theta star. And then these three angles will make up a second coordinate system, which I call the local coordinate system. And the relationship between all these angles is, is the standard uh, spherical trigonometry, right? Which can become very messy. And, and what um, Sobolev uh, made me realize um, is that, of course, you know, we are doing physics, uh, we are doing classical physics, and therefore, um, your derivation of a quantity should not depend on the coordinate system you choose, right? So ideally, you, you should be able to solve for both quantities in, in both coordinate system and you should get the same answer. But um, it, for some of these quantities, if you choose the wrong coordinate system, you end up with a very messy expression that you cannot solve. And, for, and so if you choose the other coordinate system, your, your life becomes much easier. And, and this is what um, this figure and this book and, and this scientist made me realize that there are these six or seven angles. There's a seventh angle, which, which is the scattering angle, which is related to this angle, alpha. And now if you choose the correct coordinate system for the right quantities, then your life becomes easy. So Sobolev also realized that um, you can express all these quantities of interest in terms of something he calls the reflection coefficient. At least the English translation of his Russian textbook calls it the reflection coefficient. So the reflection coefficient is nothing more than the outgoing intensity divided by the cosine of the incident angle multiplied by the incident intensity. So the simplest possible assumption you can make is rho equals to one, which is exactly the Lambertian sphere. So Lambertian sphere has rho equals to one. Now, um, Sobolev wrote down this expression in his book. So if you want to solve for the geometric albedo, if you evaluate it in the local coordinate system, so if you evaluate in this coordinate system, then the expression is very simple, right? It's just rho evaluated at zero phase angle multiplied by the square of the cosine, and then you evaluate this, in, in this, this expression. Um, if you, want to, if you want to derive the, the so-called um, uh, integral phase function, remember the, the shape of the phase curve, you have to evaluate this double integral, which I call the Sobolev flux in honor of Sobolev, but you have to do it in the observer's coordinate system. If you do it in the observer's coordinate system, this is much easier to do. This was our contribution. And the reason why it's much easier to do is because of a key insight. Remember that in the observer's coordinate system, the three angles are the observer's latitude, the observer's longitude, and the orbital phase angle, right? But um, almost all scattering phase functions that we are interested in only depend on the orbital phase angle. <laughs> so if you write it in this coordinate system, then I can just take this term out of the integral because this term only depends on alpha. <laughs> so instead of doing a messy integral, I, I can take most of this term out of the integral. And this, this is the insight that led to the generality of the result. So I don't want to, I, I have some backup slides, but I don't want to bore you with algebra, but I can summarize to you the, what we found. So, so we found um, essentially closed form solutions you can write on paper for the geometric albedo and the integral phase function for any scattering law that only depends on the scattering phase function. That's the caveat. But most of the scattering laws we are interested in only depend on the scattering, uh, the orbital phase function, sorry. Um, I keep saying it wrong. Only depend on the, on the orbital phase angle. I keep saying it wrong, sorry. 
And there's a trivial relationship between the orbital phase angle and the scattering angle. They differ just by 180 degrees. The problem was posed by Russell in 1916. The, the solutions are up initial. They have been derived from the radiative transfer equation. The only, the, the only approximation we made is that multiple scattering is isotropic. And I'm going to try to demonstrate to you in the last part that precise photometry may be more powerful at constraining the fundamental properties of aerosols than precise um, spectroscopy. So, so before I show you the results, you have every right to be skeptical, right? You can ask me, so, so this is a very nice story, and, but you haven't shown us any equations. How, how well does this work? So here's the, the spherical albedo as a function of single scattering albedo. And this is for isotropic scattering, right? This solution was known before, but so this is just a sanity check. So this is our analytical solution. And this is the numerical study from Van der Hus in 1974. And you can see the, the difference is so small that it's smaller than the thickness of the line. And in fact, you have to blow up the difference in log to see it. Here's a different result from a more recent study by Madhusudan and Barros in 2012. They, they had a very um, sophisticated treatment of Rayleigh scattering. And despite that, our analytical solution describes the spherical albedo quite well, I would say. Again, you have to see the difference in the log to, to, to see it. Uh, when does it break down? I told you that we took the approximation of isotropic multiple scattering. So if you do Rayleigh scattering, which is almost isotropic, and you do isotropic scattering, you will do very well. But as soon as you go to scattering that is highly asymmetric, in this case, the so-called G factor is 0.5, which I will describe to you later then you can start to see departures from the solution. And the departures are on the order of 10%. If you go to very extreme G factors, which we have never encountered in fitting data, like 0.99 G, where the maximum G is one, then the error becomes uh, catastrophic. You can always fix this. This is not hard to fix. But uh, in practice, when we analyze data, we never encounter this kind of G factors. And we have been analyzing quite a few data sets so far. Uh, the last slide before the last section is uh, to demonstrate to you that the, the shapes of these phase curves uh, encode important information on the reflection laws. So on the left panel, I show you some examples where the single scattering albedo is 0.5. So remember I told you that the problem is to relate single scattering to macroscopic quantities. So in this case, the shape of the phase curve. So in every single event of scattering, we scatter half the light. And in this case, you can see that depending on which reflection law you like, the shapes of the phase curves are quite different, which implies that if your data is good enough, you should be able to tell between what type of scattering behavior is happening in, in an atmosphere or surface. If your object behaves like a perfect mirror, so it, that every event scatters 100% of the light, then everything looks like a Lambertian sphere. <laughs> which is not surprising, is that's the very definition of a Lambertian sphere, right? So that's not surprising. So, so it behaves well in this limit and it gives us a useful result in, in all other um, situations. Um, that was very long, I apologize, but uh, it was a lot to explain. So the last part is about data analysis. I'm, again, I'm happy to stop and if you have questions about the theory part. So, I think no one raised hands yet. Uh, you could you could take a break, Kevin, yourself. You know, <laughs> you're, you're being no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. no, that's fine. I've given this talk several times and have okay. answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, no questions. I keep uh, going. Can oh. this one question? Yeah, uh, th this is Wen Pin. Um, Hello. <laughs> uh, I don't understand your talk, but um, but let me ask the question anyway. Um, it seems to me that you rely on some approximation when you mention you will take something out. Does it make a difference whether it's for exoplanet that is very distant away um, from a solar system body? Uh, we, we, we actually have a, a wider um, angle to see the object. I don't know whether even if I phrased the, the question correctly. No problem. I, I didn't explain it very well. So um, he, here are the more um, a different version of the slides. So, so what I was trying to tell you is that, is that if you choose this coordinate system, then the three angles are this. 
latitude. So it's actually not an approximation, it's exact. It's, a, it's an insight. So this is the latitude of the observer, the longitude of the observer, and the, the so-called orbital phase angle. Then this took me forever to realize, but actually the, the, so the scattering angle, so the, the difference between the incoming and the outgoing rays of light are trivially related to, to, to alpha just by 180 degrees. This took me like two weeks to realize. <laughs> then once you realize this, then what you realize is that uh, this function that this that relates the the the, the two um, the incoming and the outgoing angles of light in ninety nine percent of cases only depends on beta. So like Rayleigh scattering only depends on beta. So this is the key slide actually, and once you realize this, then you realize that that if I choose this coordinate system, then this is an independent angle. So when I integrate over two, these two under angles, this function doesn't participate, <laughs> it's exact. But if I do it in a different coordinate system, it's not the case, all three angles are tied together, right? So, so it looks like this. See now, instead of integrating uh, a, a, a double integral um, where this function depends on all three angles, this reduces to a problem where you can integrate that you can do you can do a two-dimensional integral as two separate one-dimensional integrals. And this doesn't participate in the integration because this doesn't depend on these two angles. I hope that was a bit clearer. But if you choose a different coordinate system, then all yeah. these three angles are tied together uh, in a message. Related, yes, yes, all right. Mm. Then they're tied, and, and I'm surprised that no one realized this, right? But it took me forever. It took me about two months to get to this point. Because something so simple like this, this took me, it really took me two weeks. I stared and I thought this cannot be right. It cannot be that simple. But that's the key insight. And, and all of the work, 90% of the work has been done by these other authors, right? I, I just had to understand what they were writing. Hmm. But uh, then this is exact, this is exact. Now, now this, this is powerful because now this comes out of the integral and this is true for any arbitrary function this function is buried in this function. I'm sorry, I should have said that. So now this is true for any scattering phase function. And now it All becomes right. very general. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, thank and, you. And to answer your question, I, I will show you, this is powerful when you analyze data. Mm. Maybe this is the, the, the most interesting part. Um, so, so I'll go on to the data part. Um, yes, please do. So I'm sorry to repeat, but just because I'm going to start using these terms like you know them, okay? So I'm just going to remind you. So the geometric albedo is the albedo at zero phase angle. The spherical albedo is the albedo over all uh, phase angles. Uh, the first two quantities are defined at a single wavelength. The bond albedo is the spherical albedo over all wavelengths. The phase integral is the ratio of the spherical, the geometric albedo, and the single scattering albedo is the ratio of cross sections for a single scattering event, okay? So now I will use these terms like you, you know all of them. So, so what are the implications? So one major implication is how you interpret phase curves at all. So the standard practice so far is you, for exoplanets at least, is you fit for the secondary eclipse, right? And then from the secondary eclipse, you get the geometric albedo, AG. You then describe the shape of the phase curve psi using a arbitrary series of sines and cosines. And if you use enough sines and cosines, you will always fit the data. This is just Fourier's theorem. But the problem is that if you use like say 20 sines and cosines and you fit the data, you, you have a hard time interpreting what the physical meaning of these coefficients are in front of the sines and cosines. So you don't get physical meaning out of the fit. With these new solutions, you have a completely different way of looking at the problem. So now with these new solutions, instead of fitting for AG and the shape directly, you fit for the fundamental parameters that determine them. So you fit for the single scattering albedo and you fit for G, which I will describe. G equals to zero is isotropic. And if G is something else, it describes the asymmetry of scattering. And if you fit for these two uh, parameters, they will automatically determine both the magnitude and the shape of the phase curve. 
uh, I think these are called uh, the HAPK parameters in the, in the lunar science literature. So we are just borrowing the, the wisdom from there, right? Uh, so, so let me show you one example where we did this. Um, but first I have to explain to you some different things, right? So this is the G factor, just to review. So G equals to zero is isotropic scattering. If G is positive one, it's mostly in the forward and G minus one is mostly in the reverse. Rayleigh scattering is almost isotropic, but not quite. It looks like a double lobe. I will, I will show you one example towards the end. So G has a, it's easy to describe G um, spatially, but G actually has a very complicated behavior in wavelength. So this is the two examples where uh, this was done using a me scattering code by my, one of my senior postdocs, uh, Daniel Kitzman, senior researcher actually. And this is the G, the, the scattering asymmetry factor and the omega, the single scattering albedo for CO2 eyes in red and H2O eyes in blue. So just to guide your intuition, here are the different limits. So now if you focus on the solid curve, these describe particles that are 10 microns in size. This is 10 microns in wavelength. So if you are 10 micron particle scattering light that is, has a wavelength shorter than 10 microns, you behave like a large particle and you forward scatter. If you are 10 micron particle and you scatter wavelengths that, uh, that are light, wavelengths of light that are, that are larger than your size, then eventually you behave like a small particle, which, be, which scatters isotropically. So whether you're a large or a small particle it doesn't depend on your physical size. It, it depends on the, relation, the ratio of your physical size to the wavelength of the light you're scattering, as you can see in this example. If you're a thousand micron particle, you always behave like a large particle, right? From, from 0.1 to 1,000 microns. You're always forward scattering. So that's, that's the, uh, the prediction of me theory, which is more than 100 years old. So we didn't invent this. Uh, it's much harder to describe omega. I don't have an intuition. Maybe some of you have an intuition and you can teach me. But uh, for example, what these me scattering calculations teach us is that water in blue is a, is a great scatterer of sunlight, a lousy scatterer of infrared radiation. CO2 ice seems to be quite special. CO2 ice is a, is a good scatterer of both sunlight and infrared radiation. And, and Wing probably appreciates this. And this is the reason why if you use a radiative transfer code that is invented for Earth and you do scattering, you do okay. But then when you apply it to early Mars, you get the answer very wrong. <laughs> and you get the answer very wrong because the radiative transfer code needs to do infrared scattering very well. And typically like two stream codes designed for the Earth don't do this very well. And this is another talk I can give you in the future if you want. So before I show you the data, there's, the other, there's another thing to tell you. I'm going to show you this data set that's been analyzed many, many times. And your eyes will, will, show, will, will show you that um, the peak of the reflected light phase curve is, is a little bit shifted from secondary eclipse, right? It doesn't quite peak at secondary eclipse. And, and, and a, a phase curve shift away from secondary eclipse is actually a direct indication that the atmosphere has non-uniform cloud cover. And this is not difficult to understand, right? Here, so here's a simulation that we did in 2016. This is a temperature map. And we assume that some species was condensing in the atmosphere. So uh, in regions of the atmosphere where it's very hot, you, nothing condenses, so it looks very dark. And in regions of the atmosphere that are not hot enough, the species condenses and is scattering light. So if you average over uh, latitude, because you don't have any information uh, over latitude in the phase curve, it looks like this. And, and, this, kind of, uh, and this kind of cloud cover will, will produce a shift in the reflected light phase curves. So one of the results that we um, reported in the Nature paper is that we managed to find um, closed form solutions also for the case of a non-uniform cloud cover. So I'm very proud of that solution, but it's, very, it's buried in the appendix. <laughs> It's not part of the main text. But you need, you need this solution to analyze data for non-uniform cloud cover. So here it is. So, so we took the same data set. We reanalyzed it. Um, well, my post, one of my postdocs, Brett Morris, reanalyzed it. And then he wrote a whole um, Bayesian fitting routine, and he fitted the, our solutions to this data set. And for the first time, as far as I can tell, in the history of the exoplanet literature, we could extract quantities that have been reported for solar system objects. 
So, so in addition to the geometric albedo, we could report the spherical albedo, the phase integral, the scattering asymmetry factor, which is consistent with zero. So the scatter the scatterers are, is consistent with isotropic scattering, meaning that the size of the aerosols in the atmosphere of this exoplanet have a size that are that is smaller than the wavelength of light uh, being recorded in the Kepler band pass. We could also tell that uh, this had two regions, a dark region where the single scattering albedo is close to zero and a bright region where the single scattering albedo is close to about 12 to 15%. And, and one of the outcomes of the analysis is that you can, you can derive empirically a condensation temperature because you know the transition between the, the bright and the dark region and the condensation temperature is around 1600 Kelvin. So that suggests that this is some kind of silicate, for example, in the atmosphere. And we're very proud of this because these quantities, the spherical albedo, Q, G, omega, and these have never been reported for any exoplanet in the literature. So these solutions allow you to do that. Now, here's a second, um, uh, here's a second example from the solar system. Um, and this is probably familiar to both of those of you on the call who, who study the solar system. So this is the Cassini phase curve of Jupiter at a certain wavelength. I don't remember which wavelength. This is probably 0.5 microns. But you can see the data is exquisite. It's so exquisite that you can, you can barely see the, the uncertainties. And because the data is so exquisite, it allows you to, to rule out uh, many reflection laws. So for example, um, it doesn't, it's not consistent with, with Lam a Lambertian sphere, not surprising. It's not consistent with Rayleigh scattering. And it's not consistent with a scattering phase function that is used widely in astronomy and planetary science called the singles Henyev greenstein so, so it's not consistent at all by many, many sigmas. It's a, it's a really lousy fit. And there are various studies that show this. But what is surprising is that this data has never been interpreted within a Bayesian framework. And my guess is probably because there, was, there wasn't a way to insert a, a, a general solution into a Bayesian framework. But because now we have these solutions, we can do that, right? So I went to the literature and I realized that um, planetary scientists really like this scatter, scattering phase function called the double Henyev Greenstein. And as far as I understand, the reason why they like it is because it, it allows for the description of both forward and backward scattering of arbitrary strengths. And this paper suggests that um, double Henyev Greensteins are capable of describing irregular particles, but I'm not actually not sure if the reverse is true. I'm not sure if, if, if your data is fit by a double Henyev Greenstein, this implies that the particles are irregular. I don't know if this is true. But anyway, since uh, the planetary scientists like this, I, this was my assumption. So I put this into my solutions. I put it into a Markov chain Monte Carlo Bayesian framework, and I fitted the data. So this I did myself because it was quite easy. Each fit took uh, a few minutes, uh, depending on how many, how accurate you wanted the fit to be. And this is one example of a Cassini phase curve. And you can see that the fit is much better, right? I mean, it's much better than these fits for sure. <laughs> so it fits, it fits much better. It doesn't completely fit some, sometimes at, at the cusp, but each fit allows you to derive at that wavelength the single scattering albedo, the G factors for backwards and forwards and the weighting between them. So now since uh, my collaborator whom I've never met, Li Ming Li was, was kind enough to give me 61 Cassini phase curves. So I repeated this exercise 61 times. And when you repeat that 61 times at each wavelength, you can derive these scattering properties of Jupiter's atmosphere. So one very interesting result is that you can see the, the single scattering albedo is always close to one. So multiple scattering is important. And then if you approach a, a, a band pass called the MT3 methane absorption band, the single scattering albedo suddenly crashes. And so does the G. The G become more consistent with zero. And, and surprisingly enough, there has been a previous study indicating that, that methane absorption is very strong in this band. So, so we have independently reproduced that, right? We've reproduced a, um, a, a strong reduction in scattering behavior in the, MT, in the MT3 band with no tuning, just from the fitting. So this is very hard to visualize. Uh, another way to visualize this is you, you take the average numbers from these fits, 61 of them, and you, you, you interpret this geometrically. So this is the geometric interpretation of how light is scattered by aerosols in Jupiter's atmosphere. 
it has a very strong forward scattering lobe and a little bit of a backward scattering lobe. And, and, the, one, and the profile in blue is really scattering. <laughs> and you can see the two are quite different. So, here, so here's the outcome from this study with, with Lee. The, the particles are large because G is not close to zero. They are possibly irregular because it's, it seems to be fit by a double hanger Greenstein. The particles are poorly dispersed, meaning there are different sizes. If there were one single size, then the G factor would decrease as a function of wavelength, and it doesn't. It's inconsistent with Rayleigh scattering, as you can see. Multiple scattering is important because omega is close to one, at least when scattering is important. There's a back scattering lobe that we can speculate about what this means. And, and we do not know what the chemical composition of these aerosols are. Chemical composition is very, very difficult. Size is much easier. So this is what we managed to get out of this study of Jupiter. So I'm done. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> so to, to summarize, um, uh, we, we put the discovery of a family of closed form solutions for the geometric albedo and shape of face curves. Uh, and, and I would claim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, this, this is a, the, a, the approximate but general solution uh, to a problem posed by Russell in 1916. I hope I've convinced you that the shapes and amplitudes of reflected light phase curves encode really important information on the reflection laws and fundamental properties of aerosols. Precise form photometry is potentially more powerful at constraining the properties of these aerosols than precise spectroscopy. If you're exoplanet scientists, this is a radical statement because the entire field is, is focused on using spectroscopy to do this, not photometry. And one of the things I'm very excited about, which Brett is, is testing on Kepler data. Uh, again, if you want to ask the question, is the exoplanet atmosphere cloudy or cloud-free? Most people would say that you need spectroscopy. But I, I would claim that an easier way to do this is by looking at the shape of the phase curve. And if it's cloud-free, this, this should have a distinct shape that is associated with Rayleigh scattering. And we are testing this now, and we find this to be the case. <laughs> But I cannot show you the, the results yet because they are not ready for publication. So I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions and, and thank you for being so patient with me for one hour. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Kevin. I mean, I, I would love to, to go do such a talk myself, you know, blast away <laughs> from beginning to the end. Yeah, I see there's uh, one question, I think from Wing Peng. Uh, I think that, uh, Wing Peng, can you, can you ask that question yourself? Right, I see the, uh... The, when you show one slide of G and Omega, uh, I see a, a discontinuity. You probably answered the, the two slides later about they are the resonant, uh, resonant band or something. No, uh, previous two, maybe. Yes. Oh, there's a typo here. Yeah. There's a yes. page, page 36. <clears throat> right. I see discontinuities. Are they the where the bands, the absorption bands are? Yes, I believe so. So to construct this, uh, this curve at least, uh, we had to make some assumption on the, uh, the absorption cross-section, right? And so some of these features are definitely due to the absorption cross-section. These features I find harder to explain. Right? Exactly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about G, right? Why should they have, yeah, why should they, be, they have band or, resonance or what uh, or not yeah i don't have a very simple explanation for you all, all okay. i can say is that all i can say is that these are um these are brute force calculations these are me scattering calculations the the only input that we require are the are the refractive indices of these things mm. okay and then we, we put it in the code and we calculated brute force and the code has been benchmarked against many other things so but i don't have an intuition for you for each and every feature in this curve all right so i i want to make sure i understand so for these curves you are talking about co2 or water ice and yes. with with that um, um radius right 10 micron oh yes so they are really ice yes they are really okay. ice all right but they are spherical we, we, we assume they are spherical. Yes, yes, uh, me scared. Okay, thank you. And, and some of this ringing, uh, now I remember, some of this ringing may, is maybe an artifact from assuming they are spherical, actually. 
Ah. Uh, this is well known actually. Now I remember. Yes. So if you are perfectly spherical and you're one size, you have this kind of ringing pattern. And, and if you assume a size distribution, the ringing actually disappears. It averages oh, wow. out. I see. Okay. Hmm. Yes. So <clears throat> anyone have uh, has, uh, other questions uh, for Professor Han? Yes. Can I, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, okay. Tony, please. Okay. Uh, it seems to me uh, from the Cassini data, we, we didn't find any, we didn't get any opposition effects. I mean, in, at, at the leader phase angle. So, so it's, is this true or, or we can, I don't know, the opposition effect, can you explain that? Uh, yeah, sure. I have this slide here. So, so here you can see the, you can actually see the opposition effect. This is the opposition effect. Um, it's still quite cuspy. Um, so it is there, <laughs> but you know what is, is, there's a lot to say here. So, so, so what I'm still puzzled about is that when people talk about the op opposition effect, they usually talk about uh, so bodies with r solid surfaces. <laughs> Like the moon or like our moon or some other moon, right? They yes. have a solid surface. And 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 typically the there are two explanations for the opposition effect. One the first effect is something called shadow hiding, is it's a geometric effect, right? So if you look at it from from every other angle than full phase, there's always some shadow that hides part of the surface. And then when you look at it at full phase, the, the shadow disappears and suddenly you have a spike in the in the brightness. This is called um shadow hiding, it's not very profound. The second effect, which I think is more profound is on this slide called coherent backscattering, which I don't fully understand. I'm, I'm still trying to understand it. And again, coherent scattering is usually discussed in the context of a body with a surface. And I've never seen it being discussed for, for like gaseous bodies like Jupiter. But, but yet in the paper, I did something a little crazy. I said, okay, I go to one of Hapke's papers and then I found the scattering phase function, the reflection law for coherent backscattering. I put it into my solution and I fit the data and it fits very, very well. It doesn't mean that coherent scattering is the explanation, but it's perfectly consistent with coherent scattering. Right, so I asked the question, um, is, is this cuspy profile in, in Jupiter due to coherent backscattering? I, I don't know what the answer is because I don't understand the physics of this very well yet. Okay, uh, there's a question from uh, Lin Ji Hong. Uh, Lin Ji Hong, can you ask the question yourself? Okay, so teacher, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, so good evening teacher. So I have one question. So we know we can, if we want to know this exoplanet the atmosphere component, we can to use the telescope to analyze the lights to penetrate this exoplanet the atmosphere. So my question is, is that we know exoplanets mostly is very far away. So this the lights penetrate the exoplanet into the earth, maybe we need to travel five light year or more. So in this the trouble inside, maybe this light will be penetrated through the high density part or something nebula. And so how, so my question is, uh, how do I, how to uh, astronomer to know this light inside the signal is this exoplanets inside elements, not the nebulas, the uh, signal. This is my question, thank you. Uh, uh, sure, so I'm not an observer, but I work with observers, so I can try to give you the, as best as I can the answer. So um, what you describe is, for example, um, um, if there's dust between you and the object, then you have to account for the, right, the light being redden, reddening. And this is uh, something that I think other people on the call will know better than me. This is something well established, right? Plus um, the exoplanets for which we can study the atmospheres are typically very, very close by. So this is not a controversial issue, right? We can only really characterize the ones that are very close to us. Um, the, 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 the thing that's more worrying is not so much the interstellar, the, the interference from the interstellar space between you and the object, is if you are using a, a telescope on, on Earth and the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way, that's a much bigger effect. And there are ways to correct for that, right? You can, for example, use um, um, 
time domain information. So instead, you can observe the, the system across time. And you can, you can use that to distinguish between what is caused by the star, what is caused by the atmosphere, and what is caused by the, the, the planet. I might have a, a slide of this to, to show you. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> and other people can ask other questions if they like. Yes, I found the slide. So I give you one example. This is not part of this talk. But for example, like, um, so, so this is work done by one of my postdocs and former postdocs. He's now a professor in Lund. <laughs> so this is time. So, so from bottom to top is time. And this is the, the blue or red shift. And this is observed in a line of iron. And this is essentially Kepler's law. This is the, the motion of the planet uh, around the star. So as the planet goes back and forth uh, with respect to you, we see this blue shift and red shift in the line. This, this line is in the atmosphere of the planet. So we can use time domain information like this to figure out that this is the planet and not something else, right? Okay, thank you. Because the, the lines of the Earth don't, the, 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 the spectral lines in the Earth's atmosphere don't do this motion. And, and you have iron there. Yeah. Yes, this, is, this was the first detection of iron in the atmosphere. We're very proud of this result too. So it must and be very hot, right? Is it this one? This one is uh, 4,000 Kelvin. It's almost like a star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and here, um, um, actually, since you asked about this, I, I can also show you this, but I need a different slide, sorry. <laughs> since you asked about this, um, So this is uh, from a different talk, but what you show, what, what I showed you earlier is, is um, this is the spectrum that we measure in blue. It's very noisy, and we take the cross section of iron, which is not controversial, and then we cross correlate with the, we cross correlate with the data. So we are basically matching the positions of iron lines, dozens or even hundreds of iron lines with the data. And once the positions of these lines all match with the data, you get a you get a signal, essentially. So this is a very powerful technique because it only requires you to believe that the cross sections are correct, which is quantum mechanics. And this technique, because you have time information, allows you to tease the the signal out of the noise. And so this was the paper where we demonstrated this. Um, I think iron was the second time it was detected and if you want to be very conservative and titanium was the first time it was detected using this method. Okay. I have a, yeah, Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Kevin, um, because you, you said you have done it for uh, Kepler 7b, right? I, I, have you done it for other, 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 other exoplanets? And, um, and with uh, different radio distances, you know, can you say, uh, Get get some idea as systematic, right? What does what the atmosphere or the cloudy condition would be? Yes. So currently, um, Brad Morris, uh, who is the postdoc who did the fit, we are now preparing a paper where we look at about twelve objects, mm. and he has picked out uh, four of the best objects, and he has done the exercise that I described to you. So I ask him do the exercise. Is the, is the shape of the face curve consistent with Rayleigh scattering or not? And, and what he finds is that even though there are four objects, the, the cooler objects have a shape that is consistent with isotropic scattering. Mm -hmm. And the hot objects have a shape that's consistent with Rayleigh scattering, exactly what you expect. So the mm -hmm. cool objects seem to be, have aerosols that scatter isotropically mm -hmm. and the hot objects don't have anything in them because the temperature is 2,500, so nothing condenses. And the scattering is done by molecules mm -hmm. using Rayleigh mm -hmm. scattering. Mm -hmm. And it seems to come out. And I'm very excited about the result. I, I keep telling him, I, I said, if you, once you confirm this, we should, we should try and publish it in Nature Astronomy or something. But he's okay. still checking the result. And, and if we have a large sample, this would be very exciting, I would mm -hmm. say. 
and you're only using the Kepler light curves, right? I and mean, nothing else. Uh, and also, of course, also your, your theory. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, Kepler, fortunately or unfortunately, because we have four years of Kepler data, continuous staring at a field, uh, this is actually some of the best data we have on reflected light. There's a, uh, again, and I don't, I'm always just talking to a, to a screen. I better show you some photos. <laughs> So, so we had four years of data of Kepler. Um, whereas um, now there's a satellite called TESS, but the problem is that TESS is not continuous staring. TESS uh, makes the, changes the field of view every 28 or 30 days. And, and that's, that's one issue. So the data is not continuous. And then the second issue is that uh, TESS, the TESS looks at light that's a bit redder than Kepler. It's, more, it's a little bit in the infrared. So, so it's even less reflected light than Kepler. <laughs> there's, a, there's a telescope led by Europe and Switzerland that I'm a part of, KOPS, but KOPS is not a survey mission. It's a, it's a point and stare mission. So again, we have this issue that we are not staring at the same object for four years. So un unfortunately, so unfortunately um, Kepler is actually the best remains the best instrument for reflected light phase curves, but unfortunately it's no longer around. <laughs> mm. The next instrument that will do something like that will be Plato. Plato will do quite well. Mm -hmm. And if you're really interested in reflected light, like, um, it would be nice to have like a dedicated white field instrument that just stares at this continuously. But I think most people don't think it's that interesting. So <laughs> why do you say that? I just my impression when I talk to people <laughs> about reflected light, they, they don't seem very excited. It's <laughs> <So, laughs> my impression. Okay. All right. Um, so any, any, other, any other questions uh, from the audience? The, the, you know, one thing that we are interested in here is uh, the Freya, that's Freya a, activity. That's, that's a raised hand. Oh, he's a, where is it? Uh, oh, yes, yeah. Thank, thanks for the nice talk. So okay, have, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I have one question for the application on astro planning. So the single, single, uh, single scattering orbital omega and the G a function of the wavelength. Yes. Yeah. But the light curve we are not monochromatic. If the, exactly. If, yeah, yeah. So how to solve the problem? Yeah. Because, yeah. So the, Omega and the G, when you analyze the light curve, if the average can you stay the average of the wavelength? Exactly. And uh, about so so uh, the light curve occur in different in different theater or different band to tell us more information about the actual plan. Uh, usually the we also explain using the R band, yeah. But if we use the I band or other band, the orbital could be different. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree with everything you said. I, I I didn't mention it because it seems like a fine detail that yeah. uh, that would get lost on people. But but you are exactly right, right? So I I told you a few times. I said I said that the spherical albedo and the geometric albedo are. are formally defined at a single wavelength. But in practice, this never happens. <laughs> in practice, you're observing, you observing something that's in between. You are, not, you are neither observing all the wavelengths, in which case you get a born albedo, neither are you observing a single wavelength. You're observing some range of wavelengths, right? So you have something that I, that I don't know how to define. So I, I usually call it, a, like in this case, I call it the Kepler bandpass integrated spherical albedo. <laughs> Right, so so that's very sharp that you caught that is is great, um, and there has been studies. I, I have the paper. I can pull it out where people compare test versus Kepler al geometric albedos because the band passes are a little bit different, and and there are a few objects for which they are they are distinctly different. <laughs> You can tell that the geometric albedos in the, the test versus K, uh, Kepler band parts are different. And then on the KOPS mission, when we measure the KOPS geometric albedo, they are also a little bit different. And why should they be the same? Because 
if you look at Jupiter, right? If you look at Jupiter, right? So this is the, the geometric albedo of Jupiter. So if I put different band passes at different wavelengths, you don't expect the same, the same geometric albedo in the band pass, right? So yes, indeed, if, if you could, the best case scenario is that you have an instrument that does this, you can measure it across wavelength. If you don't have that instrument, then you look at different like band passes. So the, the Kepler band pass will be somewhere here and the, and the test band pass is a bit redder. The chaos band pass is closer to that. Maybe I have a figure to show you if you can um, be, if you are patient with me. Yeah, we are patient. <laughs> You're next, yeah. So, so sorry, one second. Yes, I got it. Uh, because this is work I actually haven't published yet. <laughs> so so we should close our eyes. I actually don't know if I will ever publish it, so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> It's just like, it's more like notes to myself, you know? I, I don't publish everything I write down. So here, here's the, you see, here's exactly what you're asking, you see? Like, this is the, the different band passes. You see, like, you, see, you can see the, the test band pass, which is this, it's a bit redder, right? And then the Kepler band pass is in green here. And the Kops band pass is, is a bit hard to see, but it's this one. This, this gray dash one. And you can see the band paths are slightly different. So we always were wondering, you know, if you measure Kops or Kepler versus TAS, you should get slightly different values of the geometric albedo. Um, and, and for just to give you a sense, this is the Jupiter's um, um, geometric albedo over plotted, right? I, and I even estimated this, right? I, I, I asked myself the question, if Jupiter was an exoplanet and I could, observe it using these different telescopes, how, how would it look like? And, and it looks like this. So you can see like this is, if you pretend that Jupiter is an exoplanet and you look at it using different telescopes, you will get a slightly different geometric or spherical albedo. I think that answers your question, right? Yeah. So, okay. You're really energetic. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, can I ask a second, uh, second question? Okay, you go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. So I just curious how it's possible you uh from the Likers to detect a super rotation super rotation on how to be two. Yeah, so theoretical and the simulation has shown us for how to be the super rotating wind around the equator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it could be more cloudy. So I think uh, you have one flash in there. Yes, in the, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. So indirectly, it, it tells you that indirectly. So, um, uh, so basically, there's a, this is, I mean, it's a bit covered, but this is the pattern of super rotation. Right? Yeah. There's, a, there's a pattern of super rotation. And what we are saying here is that if you take this pattern of super rotation and you overlay the condensation curve on top. Mm -hmm. Then in reflected, in thermal emission, you will see everything. You will see this, um, I wish I had a slide on this. You, you will see this like arrow shaped feature, right? That, that is from the super rotation. But in reflected light, you only see the parts that are cold enough, that are below the condensation temperature. And now if you, if you integrate over this direction, you will see this. Essentially, so you indirectly you see the pattern, mm -hmm. but not directly. If if um, if the atmosphere was covered with something that maybe I should just show you the paper. If the if the atmosphere was covered with with a with a substance that was very refractory, meaning that the planet is uniformly reflective, then you would see a uniform um, sphere. And I mentioned this paper that one of my postdocs is working on. The surprising thing is that we find four other planets that are consistent with uniform spheres. Kepler 7b seems to be a bit special. The other four planets are, are very uniform. There's no shift <laughs> at all in the reflected light. Um, okay, where's the paper?
I found the paper, but um, I need to um, go to the right page. So it's a very long time ago. Well, well, for me, it's a very long time ago. This was five years ago. I don't remember a lot of it. This is the paper where we showed the, yeah. See, this gives you a better idea. Oh, sorry, sorry. But you saw that thing I'm trying to show you <laughs> once it stops doing this. Maybe you want to ask another question first. It's easier for me why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I can show you. Okay. You see, like, like, like this, uh, this is um, Fosterite, yeah, Fosterite. So Fosterite has a lower condensation temperature than titanium oxide. So titanium oxide is more refractory, so to speak. That's what we mean, right? So because this is a lower condensation temperature, that means that um, there are, there's a bigger part of the atmosphere for which is not condensed out, right? So it's in its gaseous form. So here, here Fosterite is gaseous and outside Fosterite is solid. So it's, ref so it's scattering light. Titanium oxide has a higher condensation temperature. So it's, it's much more condensed out <laughs> than foster right, you know? So the phase curves of these two will look different. It depends on the condensation temperature. And so what you're seeing in the reflected light phase curve is, some, is, is, is a combination of the underlying super rotation heat map, temperature map and the, the condensation pattern. Okay, thank you. Hey, Professor Yuin Li, Yuin Lao Okay, uh, so hi, Kevin, Hello. this is Yunning from Shida. So I, I'm from the star formation community, so I might ask some stupid questions. So That's correct me if I understood it wrong. So you, you, from with your model, you are able to retrieve the scattering, uh, scattering properties as function of the scattering angles, right? But with this, is it, how, how could you, lift completely the degeneracy in the chemical compositions. Um, so how could I do this without knowing the chemical composition? I mean, I mean, you mentioned about the, the, the degeneracies at the beginning, but with, with only the scattering properties, is it possible already to lift all the degeneracies regarding uh, the chemical composition? Uh, um... Let me try and answer your question this way, and you, you can tell me when if I'm not clear. So, uh, so basically, the the solutions are derived as a function of these parameters, right, omega and g, and then we use them to ask the data what is the value of omega and g that satisfies um, that the that that the, that is satisfied by the data. Um, we cannot, and this is the, both the strength and the weakness of this is that it doesn't care about the chemical composition. It only cares about right. the omega and the G. So you can have many different mm -hmm. chemical compositions that give you the omega, that's fine. Um, that's one thing to say. The, the second thing to say is that the reason why chemical composition is difficult is because um, you, you, can, you can think of it, it's easier to think of a spectrum. So in a spectrum, the, the, the size of the particle shows up as a slope in the continuum. So if you're a large particle, you have a flat continuum. And then if you're a small particle and you have Rayleigh scattering, then you have some kind of slope in your continuum, right? And now if your, mm -hmm. spectrum, if your spectrum is has enough wavelength coverage, you may potentially be able to see if the particle was one size, you may be able to see a transition from small particle to large particle. So from a slopey continuum to a flat continuum, you know? But, um, and, and the composition and the transition between the slopey and the flat continuum depends on the composition. And this is the reason why composition is so difficult because the composition requires you to, me to measure a change in the slope of the spectral continuum. So it's like a second order effect. You have, and, and that's very, very hard to do in spectra if you, um, if, if you are a spectroscopist. Um, but uh, fortunately, this is fine. Because what we found is that, uh, going back to your question about the big picture, what we found is that 
at the end of the day, if, if all I'm interested in is asking the question, how much water do I find in this spectrum, right? And the answer is degenerate with uh, the presence of these clouds or aerosols. It turns out that I can get out the correct answer without knowing the chemical composition of the aerosols. I just need to know the, the size distribution and the, how the, the cloud is spread out across the atmosphere. I actually don't need to know the chemical composition of the aerosol. So what I get out of this analysis is the, the, the chemistry of the gas phase. But of course, at the end of the day, you would like to know what's the real chemistry. What's the chemistry of the gas phase plus the aerosol combined? And I don't think that that question has an answer from the data. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I see. And I have another question regarding the, the scattering. Where, where exactly does the scattering happen in the atmosphere? Do you have um, any plan in the near future to uh, de further develop your model to account for any vertical structure of the atmosphere? So the, the scattering, the, the, the scattering or emission from the atmosphere always happens in some some layer where the so-called optical depth is roughly one, right? This is called the mm -hmm. photosphere. It's, it's like, for example, when you look at the surface of the sun, you see this 5,700 Kelvin surface in the sun. And then if you look at different wavelengths, the, the surface you see in the sun will change, right? Depending mm -hmm. on where the optical depth one. And, and this is what the solutions are, are showing you. So these okay. solutions are, are, are telling you where the, where the photosphere, the scattering photosphere is as a function of wavelength. So the, the strength for the solution is that it tells you, it locates the photosphere for you, but it doesn't tell you what pressure the photosphere corresponds to. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So it's, it's both the strength and the weakness of the analysis. It doesn't, it, it doesn't require me to know what the pressure is, but if I want to know the pressure, then it's a weakness. But the vertical okay. structure is taken into account. The, the, you see, the approximation being made here is that it's a semi-infinite atmosphere, which means that we pretend that the scattering parameters are the same vertically, right? And of course, in reality, this is not true. This is a, and this is why it's a solution of, um, I would say, intermediate complexity. But, but the reason why this is still useful is because uh, before this solution came along, people were either making very complicated models where you have no chance of fitting data because it's too slow, or they were making very naive models that were too simple. And this solution sits nicely in the middle. It allows you to fit the data. And after you get these numbers out, it, it, it will then inspire the modelers to try and see if they can explain these results. OK, thank you. All right. Thank you um, for this wonderful model. Thank you, Anika Rinaosu, for the questions. Um, other questions from the audience? I think that we might have, uh, even though Kevin said he, he budgeted the two hours you know, for us, but he might, might have uh, already exhausted. Not him, but uh, us, you know. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. When is the next chance to visit uh, your, your fine university in Taiwan? Where, uh, is the, are the borders still closed? We it's still cool. have, yeah, yeah. But if you, you want to stay in our, you know, our, our, our hotel for 14 days, you know. <laughs> 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 but I think it, it would not be too far away, you know. So maybe next year, next year. Yeah. And uh, but, you, you, you're right. You know, we, you're reminding us to really to plan the, 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 the delayed you know, symposium. Yeah, next year, yeah. Mm. Well, I don't want to invite myself, but it would be really fun to meet the other awardees and give a seminar together and talk about science. It would be a wonderful week or something. To yeah, Wen Peng is here and he's, he's the organizer and he's reasoning. Yeah, I'm sure he's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, all of you, are, I know, are, are, are being, how to say, academically uh, promoted you know, <laughs> to greatness. Like like the Stephen Smart, he, he was elected uh, uh, FRS a few years ago, so two wow. years ago, yeah. And uh, there's uh, Christopher Reynolds. Reynolds, he is now a chair professor at Cambridge. Wow. So there's uh, all, <laughs> and you have you you yourself to so you know you you. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. Can I show you? Can I show you two things, and then we 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 go. Please, off? please. Uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. wanted to show you a little bit. Um. So, um, this is a slide that summarizes everything we are thinking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is all of the fields that um, 
my my group or chair cares about. So photochemistry, you know, aerosols, atmospheric circulation, mm -hmm. geochemical cycling, outgassing, Bayesian mm -hmm. techniques, telescopes, mm -hmm. right? And then this is the this is the new configuration that we will set in Munich. One second. Mm -hmm. This is the configuration. So I don't know if you know these scientists, they, they are already there. They are associate professors. They have very well-established planet formation groups. And then I, I will bring um, these two along. They're already in my group. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we will hire for these two positions. So this is the, the entire chair at Munich. Let, 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 you know, I mean, uh, well, look at this. Uh, this is very tempting, you know, and uh, we should discuss. Let me talk to some of those uh, powerful uh, uh, people like uh, Professor Yuning Yuning Li, you know, <laughs> and uh, how to how to how to. We would be very happy to have some, you know, establish some uh, exchange program or something like that. Uh, uh, and with you, I mean, that, I would be very happy to host people yeah. from not just your institute but Taiwanese institutes in general. Yeah, sure, we sure, also sure. have. Yeah. Yeah. We also have this two meter. I don't know if you know this. We have this two meter on a mountain two hours away from, from Munich. <laughs> it's called Wendelstein Observatory. I think we have invested millions in it. So, so, we, so this so is we, we we may point visiting you in November October certainly. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> I'd love to have you. Yeah, and uh, and all the you know uh, all the best wishes you know for for the success of your your new new group. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and. Uh, this is a layer stool, right? That you call it layer stool. Um, yes. This is a uh, great thing, yeah. And um, much better than anything you could get uh, of some other places, I tell you, uh, Kelvin. <laughs> I'm okay, very good. glad to hear that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Ling Ping, you have to say something to say goodbye to, to Kelvin? Yeah, Kevin, yeah, nice to see you again. And I hope to see you in Taiwan soon. And Absolutely. Thank you, for, thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your kindness when I visited in 2015. So I look forward to the next visit. Yeah, and, by and all take, means. And take, and take the, uh, your, your wife and baby come along. Um, we will try. Now we have two. So oh, you have two, two now. Okay. We have, right. we have two two boys, three and six. I don't know if it's possible. Okay. We'll <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Good night. Yeah, for us. Thank yeah. And uh, still, you know, you have plenty of to do for the day. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.